So now let's start by talking about the first question, which is, are the results valid? And what that really means, we want to look at the study and see if we can trust the results that we get. And to answer that question, we want to know if the two groups here and here are pretty similar in all respects except for the fact that they got the treatment. And so we want to know if they are prognostically balanced. At the start, as the study progressed, and at the end of the study. So let's go through all of these. Let's start with the first one, at the start. So for the first question at the start, we want to be sure that this group, the control group, and the experimental group are pretty much the same in every respect that we can uh, in every respect, really, that we have the same amount of diabetics in here as we have in here, the same amount of hypertensive here as we have here, the same amount of men in both groups, the same amount of women, the same amount of elderly, the same amount of young people, all the different factors that we could look at, we want to have them the same. Now, the best way to do that is through randomization. There's no way you'd be able to pick and choose uh, on your own and put people in those groups because you're going to eventually miss something. You might have the, not noticed that that you were supposed to also look at smoking and then end up with a lot of smokers in one group compared to another. So randomization. But sometimes alone that will not work. So there's that story of the surgeons who were doing a study in which some patients would get a lap coli and the other one would get an open coli. And this choice was supposed to be randomized in the sense that they would uh, get a sealed envelope which they would have to open at the time the patient is on the table. And it would either say lap coli or open coli on the inside and they would have to do whichever one was inside. The thing is, these procedures were not equally easy to do, especially on the night shifts. The open coli would always require the attending to be present in order to get started. So on the night shifts, what the residents would do is to hold the envelopes up to the light and they'd keep going until they found one that said lap coli and then that's the envelope they would pick and so this is obviously this is obviously not real randomization so what you want to do is conceal the whole randomization process so randomization should be concealed and probably the best way to do it is to have some off-site randomization person that you call and then they tell you what to do so the second thing we do is we want to conceal randomization. Now the third thing is that you want to make sure that after randomization that they were about balanced in all the factors you could think of. So after the randomization, both the control and experimental group should have about the same number of men, same number of smokers, same number of women, same number of old, same number of young, same number of diabetics, etc. And the way you check for this is you look at what's usually going to be table one in these studies. And then you go through this table and you make sure they're about the same in each group. And uh, if they're not, you can. there are statistical ways you could kind of get around this, but that's out of the scope of this video. So we really just want to make sure that they are about the same in each group and you can look at table one. Now we admit that there might be things that we forget to put on this table, like maybe we forgot to look uh, at weight, maybe some of these guys are, the control group is way, way, way more obese than the experimental group, and that has an effect. So there, there's a limitation to this, and this is only the things that you could think of looking at, the things that you think might be important, and other factors may be missed. But for those that they look at, make sure that they are prognostically balanced in all the, the factors that we can think of. So that's how we look at prognostic balance at the start. We'd like to see that they're randomized. They can't always be, but it's nice if they are. If they were randomized, was it concealed? And let's see how good a job we did by looking at table one. Are they otherwise similar in prognostic factors? Because we want the only thing to be different between the two groups is whether they got treatment or not. And the next thing we want to look at is to see if we had no bias introduced as the study progressed. So here again we have our sample that we split into two groups control and experimental, and hopefully it was done through some randomization process. Now the control got the placebo and the experimental got the treatment. And then we watched them over time and we observed for some outcome. And that outcome we already said is we either want to see uh, the increase of something good, a benefit increase, or 
a decrease of something bad, a risk reduction. But in this process, there's a lot of people involved, and a lot of people can introduce their own biases. There are the physicians who are administering the medicines, or it could be any clinician, really. It could be that there are also the patients themselves that are receiving the treatments. There are the people who are looking at the outcome to see whether the benefit increase is present or the risk reduction is, de is present or decreasing. So these are the outcome adjudicators, but that's too big a word, so I'm going to say outcome checkers. And then there's also the people who analyze the data afterward. So each one of these groups has the ability of introducing bias. For example, the clinicians, they might be giving more care or being more uh, uh, attention to those who get the medicines or the treatment than those who don't, because these are their darling patients. They got the treatment drug, so let's give them a little bit more attention. So maybe we miss something in these guys. Now, the patients themselves, they may, uh, they may have a placebo effect, too. Like, if they know they're getting the medicine, they might report, yeah, I do feel better, whereas those who didn't get it might say, yeah, I didn't feel better, whereas this is just all subjective. It's the placebo effect, so they can introduce their own bias. Now, the outcome checkers and the data collectors can also introduce their own bias. They might be looking more carefully at the people who got the treatment to look for this result than they would in the patients who didn't get the treatment. And the data analyzers also might see trends that are not there. Uh, they might see them more so in patients who are getting the treatment than those who are not. So you can see there are a lot of places bias can be introduced. So how do we fix that? We should blind everyone that we can so nobody knows who got the treatment or who didn't, except for someone who has no involvement with this process whatsoever. So it's not until the end can you actually see who uh, had the treatment or not. So blinding of everybody, subjects, clinicians, the outcome uh, adjudicators, as well as the data collectors, and the data analyzers will help remove some of the bias as the study is progressing. The key word here is blinding. Now, let's look at the study's end. So here I'm representing the end of the study. This is after these groups have received their placebo or treatment. And here are the, the, the subjects at the end. And of course, we're checking for their outcome, whether they had something good happen or something bad. Uh, decrease and the first thing we want to know is if follow-up is complete. For the sake of this discussion let's say that we're looking at a benefit increase so we're looking at these guys with the green are people who got the benefit in that group. So in this case if follow-up is complete we can see that three out of these four had the benefit increase and only two out of these four had the benefit increase. However Let's say that one of these guys moved and didn't finish the study. So we have no idea what happened to that guy. Now, if we look at the, the stuff like this, if we look at we know that two of the three had the benefit here, and, only, and three of the four had the benefit here. And our goal in this study is to show that this treatment had an effect. So we can say, hey, look, it, it had an effect. This, is, this one is much more than this one, so it definitely had an effect but not so fast. We don't know what happened to that other guy. It's best just to assume the worst case scenario for our study. So, so here's our guy that left the study and worse for us would be if he actually also had the benefit because now what does that mean? Now it means that this is not actually 66 percent. It is 75 percent and this is actually the same here which means there is no difference in treatment, no difference that the treatment caused. Or maybe someone from the experimental group left. And let's look at, uh, instead, let's look at the risk reduction. So let's say that these people had that negative outcome. Two of them did here, and one of them did here. So you'd be tempted to say that this group had a 50% uh, rate of the negative outcome, whereas this group had a 25% rate of the negative outcome. However, we didn't account for this guy racing around in his little sports car. So, worst case scenario, he also 
had the negative outcome, making this 50%. And again, now we see no difference between the group. So if follow-up is not complete, consider those who were lost to follow-up as the worst case scenario. Not the worst case for the patient, but worst case for your study, worst case for finding a difference. Next we want to ask, was the trial stopped early? Maybe the trial was supposed to go on for a year, but at three months we stopped it earlier because everyone in the control group died. So you stopped and said, ooh, stop it there. Okay, looks like our experimental group is doing much better than the control group. So hooray, successful study. However, what would have happened if we would have gone on to a year? Maybe everyone in the experimental group would have died too and there would be no difference. And so maybe this really didn't cause any difference. So we want to make sure that if the trial was stopped early, we know why and we interpret those results with caution. Sometimes you just have to stop a trial early, like if everybody is dying in one group and you don't want to hurt any more people. But that's fine. But just make sure you interpret that study properly. Don't say, oh, don't, you know, falsely attribute some benefit that is probably not there. Hooray, look, everyone came back to life. Isn't that great? Now let's look at the last questions, and that is, are the patients analyzed in the groups in which they were assigned? And so what that means is maybe this guy here in the experimental group decided that he just wasn't going to take his medicine, so he was non-compliant. So you might be tempted to say, well, this guy didn't take his medicines, and these guys didn't get any medicine, so these guys are actually very similar. So why don't we analyze this guy in this group? But before you do that, you got to ask yourself, why didn't this guy take the medicine? Maybe it was obnoxious to take, or maybe it had some side effects or something. But there's something about that treatment that makes it hard to take. And so that's really going to apply to all of these people. So you really can't really put him in this group. You need to include him in this group. Go back down there, buddy. So don't let people move groups. He needs to stay back where he belongs within the initial group in which he was assigned. So let's do a quick one minute review of everything we looked at in this video. We are judging whether these results are valid and the way to do that is to check to see that the studies are prognostically balanced at the start as the study progresses and at the end. And at the start randomization is the key. It's going to do better than any process that we could try to create on our own. And we want to make sure that randomization is concealed. Preferably someone who's not involved in the study, you got to call them on the phone, is going to determine who goes in which group. And then check table one. See if it shows that things are pretty much evenly distributed. As the study progresses, we know that everybody has the ability of introducing bias. And so we want to remove that so everybody gets blinded. Nobody knows who has the treatment and who had the placebo. Only at the end can we tell that. And finally, at the end of the study, we want to make sure that follow-up is complete. If we lost anybody to the study, consider them as the worst case. We want to know if the trial was stopped early. If it was, interpret the study with caution. And finally, we want to make sure that all the patients stayed in the groups that they were initially assigned. So by answering this question, we, these, these many questions we have posed here, we can kind of judge in treatment studies the validity of the studies. Okay, so next we're going to go to how we interpret the results of a study. See you in the next video.